Welcome to Boundless Pursuit, a weekly podcast providing motivation, entertainment, and education to anglers and outdoorsmen. I hope that the stories you'll find here will encourage you to chase your passion more fervently, to open your mind to new opportunities and perspectives. Your engagement and feedback is critical to the growth of this show, and I would love to hear your suggestions on topics or potential guests. You can reach me at boundlesspursuitfishing at gmail.com or at my website, www.boundless-pursuit.com. That's where you'll find all related articles, media, and merchandise. Please remember, the show will gain traction from your support. Be sure to like, comment, and share this podcast to your friends and connections. I'm your host, David Graham. Now let's get on to today's episode. There are a few fish that are near and dear to my heart, and one of them is the alligator gar, North America's largest predatory species capable of reaching over eight feet in length and an excess of 250 pounds. With a mouthful of razor-sharp teeth and armored scales, these fish are built for war. But still, though, many people only know them as a slow-moving bottom feeder, and a lot of anglers don't want to sling meat and sit around for hours baking in the hot sun, just sitting and waiting for a bite. It doesn't appeal to everybody. But these fish are predators. They will absolutely eat lures and flies. And today's guest is Danny Scarborough of Houston Fly Fishing. And he's joining to highlight the opportunity of chasing alligator gar on the fly. And during this conversation, we also take time to talk about chasing the smaller but respectably sized long nose gar which can still grow to five feet in length in their own right, and by most measures is still a giant freshwater fish. And in many ways, they may be more challenging to catch on artificial lures than alligator gar. But Danny isn't just chasing these fish. He's also guiding for them. So he's tapping into the untapped resource that some of these non-traditional sport fish represent. So we're talking bowfin, carp, buffalo, and other non-traditional species. Because these fish are still measuring points for an angler's well-roundedness and ability to solve puzzles. And you know that I couldn't let this conversation slip by without touching on some of the tactics that he uses for catching bowfin on the fly specifically. Now, Texas anglers like their fish big, and they don't get much bigger than the alligator gar. This is Danny Scarborough of Houston Fly Fishing. Yeah, I'm ready to be a radio DJ, but um, um, anyway, Danny right? Yes, so your your actual name is not on your Instagram, so I didn't want to like sit here and call you Houston Fly Fisher. Oh, yeah. like, I mean, what the hell is this guy's name? But then I saw when yeah. you uh when you booked it, I saw it. But but Danny, I, I appreciate your time. You know, I feel like I'm burdening the working class heroes out here, the guys like myself who have like jobs and get out and you know, I mean, granted you're guiding and stuff, but yeah, yeah, we're pretty been pretty good lately. That's awesome. Well, we're going to get into that. Uh, we'll get we'll get into the meat and potatoes of it here soon. But, dude, um, you have a style of fishing that interests me a lot. So I'm glad I found somebody who's done it and done it well. But um, I'm just going to dive right straight into it. The alligator gar fly fishing thing that you do is, like, of major interest to me. So I like, really wanted to find somebody, but, like, find somebody solid that could talk yeah, about that. Because yeah, I caught a dabble, but there's not anyone that's like hardcore doing. It. Yeah, and it, that which blows my mind. But I think I think yeah. maybe this what we're doing now, like there needs to be more conversation around the fact that alligator gar aren't just big dumb lumbering fish that just eat meat off the bottom. Exactly. Because it's like that doesn't that doesn't tickle everybody's fancy. You know what I mean? People want to throw lures. People want to throw flies. I've even talked to guys who. Uh, you know, about alligator gar fishing, trying to sell them the idea about how awesome they are. And they're like, oh, that's cool. Like, like, but then they always go to, well, will they take a fly? Will they take a, all they want to know is, will they take a lure? I'm like, shit. Like, you know, just the simple fact that they get 200 pounds isn't enough. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I really want to get into that because, dude, I've, I've caught a lot of alligator gar. It's an incredible fish. But I think even though the public perception seems to be changing and people seem to, enjoy the fish a little bit more slowly over time they're still sort of lumped into that slow dumb 
you know, bottom feeding fish category. And I want somebody here who can, who can break that idea. But tell me about the, the alligator gar fly fishing thing you're doing. Uh, just how you got into it, you know, where, where that began for you. Yeah, I've been, I mean, I grew up in kind of the Montgomery County area and it's a pretty hot zone for alligator gar, obviously. Uh, so we'd always kind of run into them over the years and been dabbling in it and uh, guiding like the bayou and stuff like that. We sight fish one every now and again, uh, hanging out with the buffalo and stuff. We were mostly carp fishing, but then there'd be a three foot alligator gar hanging out. You don't mm-hmm. not throw at it. He would snap yeah. a <laughs> fish fly just immediately. Uh, and then from there, just over the years, kept finding these little spots, you know, still playing with like the three footers and the two footers and stuff. Uh, but in the last two years, uh, it's been like, let's try to get the big ones. You know, me and my other buddy I grew up with, he's been getting pretty hard into the bait fish part of it. And so I've been going out with him and trying to shut him up with the fly rod. And most days I do, but he comes back and finds a bigger one <laughs> the next time. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So it's been just kind of that. And, uh, learning kind of where they live all the different habitat they live in not just the rivers uh the lake stuff's probably the hardest but they're also in swamps and oxbows and things that they get trapped in during the hurricane and floods and stuff so kind of find them in those zones in shallow water where we can sight fish them uh and now in the last two years doing it with 12 weights and looking for 100 pounder you know trying to get bigger obviously but still trying to break 100 pounds after this year i think our biggest we didn't weigh it, but 69 inches. They say in the Aggie, a little scale is nine, uh, 83 pounds. But, oh, you know, okay. They, they hold their weight kind of different. They didn't ask for a girth. So, guesstimate, you know, but 69 inches is a pretty big fish. Still under 100, we know that for sure. But pretty big gar on a, on a fly rod. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, that's like a style of fishing that's, I don't want to say it's being pioneered, but it's still like, it's still new territory. You know what yeah, I mean? It's like, like we're we're everyone that I talk to, we're all dabbling, kind of playing with some ideas off yeah. each other, finding out what really works. And uh I think yeah, that, that really side good. of it uh, that side of it is exciting because it's like, you know, a lot of different kinds of fish, like as a fly target, like you you have resources to like get online and figure out like the best fly patterns or best I'm yeah. not a fly fisherman, so yeah. just just word of uh, I don't know. Caution to people listening. I might sound like a total buffoon. It's like <laughs> it's something I want to add to my repertoire in the next few yeah, years. Um, and now, listen, I can, I can, you know, I can do the fundamentals, you, but I need to get. Hell. You'll exhale with, with with like shallow water sight fishing. Yeah. Uh, well, it's something I it's something I want to get into, but I just I I'll just preface this conversation for people i yeah. might use the most basic terminology <laughs> if i say the wrong stuff that's fine okay i'm <laughs> listening with everybody else but um but in, in any case you know it, i i love the style of fishing where you're chasing targets most people don't chase because yeah, exactly. it's like there's is a there's a lot more learning involved and there's a lot less resources of information out there but it's like i mean i don't know man at the core level it, it's just a, it, it seems like alligator gar or all gar are pretty uh, opportunistic type predators that normally don't turn down an easy pretty, meal that comes within yeah, close. Snap it if it's within their nose. I try to cross close to their eyes so I get a better hookup. Yeah. But they can't, if it crosses their face, they see it. Usually they eat it. That's what I was wondering. It's like, I didn't, I, you know, cause like, what is the challenge? I know like a fly angler needs to know that there's going to be some challenge involved, but in my experience with most gar, not necessarily alligator gar is that getting them to bite isn't yeah. the hard part. It's, yeah. the, it's like, Look it's fine. It's finding them and, and keeping them buttoned. Yeah. So I don't know. Let's start with, uh, let's start with like finding them. Like, um, you know, I know you mentioned that they're, they're pretty much everywhere, but I mean, are you yeah, then, are you waiting to see them roll, or is it like yeah. I know this is where the food hangs out, so we'll go there's there? Like, there's definitely a bit of that. Yeah, uh, if you're seeing air gophers, rollers, whatever you want to call it, I mean, you know they're there. Uh, but yeah, if you're in the river system, I'm looking for swirls, slower water. Uh, they're they're not really going to be in the faster water unless they're just feeding hard, and it's harder to feed those fish flies in the yeah. faster water. You can, switch to a full sink line and have success. But if you can find these other fish in the slower slack water hunting, 
that's kind of better. Uh, lake stuff, same thing. You're looking on like flats, you know, and trying to find them in those shallow places. Uh, not as good at the lake alligator gar fishing myself. Unless they're skinny, especially in the springtime when they want to spawn on like the flooded lakes and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, mostly on the lakes, I'm getting a lot of spotted gar and long nose gar. Uh, they seem to do better on the lakes, and most of the lakes uh, that the alligator gar used to be on, they're not really as prevalent, at least on some of the Brazos system and some of the other systems that I've been on. Uh, for whatever reason, they're not there anymore. But yeah, more long nose gar and stuff. But then, yeah, uh, the oxbow stuff too, same thing shallow water flats looking for you know access to deep water but they'll come up pretty far on these flats same thing on the lake access to deep water preferably river channel kind of deep water uh and then yeah looking for logs basically or air gulpers uh with a tail that's wiggling or just cruising a little bit or looking for eyeballs if the, if the log's being completely still because sometimes i mean i've been tricked a few yeah. times by the log <laughs> it was yeah. super crazy to be like is that a log or a fish? You know, it's so yeah, cool. right. <laughs> uh, yeah, because that's yeah, what I was wondering. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of the tactics is just looking for areas where uh, I know that they're going to be hunting bait, mm-hmm. high chance areas. Uh, there's other places that you can find them, but and then the fact that they're bimodal and they go bare is yeah. really beneficial for us. Uh, and then in the slower parts, if you can't sight fish them, uh, at least when they're gulping, you, and there's usually a lot of them gulping. If there's a bunch in one area and you sit there long enough, you'll see it. Uh, we can then go to our intermediate lines. Not as much sink. I'll do sink a little bit. Depends on the flow. Uh, mostly doing a lot of river stuff uh, for the alligator gar, especially too. Uh, but yeah, uh, we mostly do intermediates with 12 weights, slow sinking bait fish flies. I have stuff like they're really eating just like a lot of shad. I mean, something that small. Interesting. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just so I, I try to play with all the other big giant musky stuff and different things, but. Day in and day out, these little guys do it. I mean, this is one that's been chewed to shit and got a little 50-pound left on it. <laughs> <laughs> we're catching them on 50-pound fluoro. Uh, that's probably the lightest I'll go on the big ones because we're getting chewed through on and an 80-pound fluoro also. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. I guess that maybe covers most of the stuff. I kind of ripped some things out. No, well, I'm going to keep digging because I know, like, you know, I, I, I can relate a lot of this to my experience with alligator gar and most gar. Like, you know, I fished the Trinity River and the Red River and a few smaller rivers in South Texas, like the Guadalupe and and uh, some little marshes down south of Houston uh, when yeah. I was in Corpus Christi. And uh, I I never found opportunities. I never I'll say this. I've never seen an alligator gar swimming by. Yeah. And I was like, I tried. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I went around my canoe. I went around my boat. I'm like, where are they? I don't only see them roll and then go back down. But yeah, I was like, river. I get so jealous of the guys that find them <laughs> hanging out. So I didn't know if, like, your approach is like, are you blind casting ever? Or is it strictly we're looking for fish and that's the only time we're casting? Yeah, if, if I'm blind casting, it's two rollers or a okay. bunch of air gulpers or something like that. Uh, we do like in the river. You got a pretty good chance at the blind cast and everything else. Not really. You really want to get out there and look for them. Pull around. I pull my raft and stuff. Depends on if in the swamps and stuff. It's real shallow. Uh, but yeah, just pulling, looking for them in the kayak, slow, slow paddling. Uh, trolling in the boat can work too. Just things like that. Just high probability zones next to where you can sight push them and take your time. Be ready that those fast snaps where they gulp bloop, bloop. if mm-hmm. sometimes if you can get boom to here it'll sometimes snap the fly still but yeah. ideally if you are gulping and you're throwing air gulpers it's more level kind of lazy gloop, then he'll eat your fly that's what that yeah. big one the other day did uh just we had a long grindy day my buddy had hooked one little maybe three and a half four i don't remember exactly and i was kind of jealous like all right let's go we're done you know then that one just floated up bloop threw a fly over it 90 degrees <laughs> like, so is that like the key to, to drawing the bite out of them i've seen that a little bit out of like long nose gar when i like throw rope lures at them as the closest thing i've done to any artificials for for gar is that it did seem that way it's like they were very specific like you needed to bring it across their face like yeah, like yeah, t-bone in it and yeah, uh no, no food really just runs into them you really want to cross like to me like here's their here's their mouth eyes here i want to cross in this zone over the okay. head 
yeah. not a beer even. I want it here because even even the, even the alligator gar just have a little more gristle further back towards their eyes. If you look at all the hookups where my flies are, a lot of times the best ones are back in there, not the tip of the nose. Same thing with the long nose gar, long bony nose. I use no rope flies at all. Uh, I just aim closer to the eyes, and you know you'll they'll throw some hooks, but SC15 little thinner gauge wire hook yeah. it sets pretty good. Sometimes it doesn't even hook into him. It, the gap of the hook wraps around the bone, and he's just hooked in with that because of the barb. But yeah, <laughs> I've had that like happen. That, high probability yeah. areas, tip of the nose, probably not as much, you know. And you can do that with a fly rod, right? Uh, a little easier, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because like the the long nose gar would just give me fits. Like if it didn't come yeah. straight over their bill, and they followed it, like you know what I mean. Like if it came, like if they were able to turn and get behind it. They just follow it all the way to the boat. Yeah. Put their nose yeah. right on the edge of it, but never commit to snapping at it. Now, I didn't know if the alligator like, gar. Puppy dog. Every now and again, you get a real fast, lungy, musky kind of eat, which is really cool. Yeah. But, but I didn't yeah, know if the alligator really... gar were doing the same. Yeah. But, yeah. Um... And then another thing for the long nose gar, I'll go to like really small, like size eight hooks, like mm. stuff that I throw at carp for carp bugs. 2x wire but that size 8 hook really sets in good the hard part's getting it back out which i have big long pliers my buddy got me he got tired of seeing me bleed <laughs> yeah well what i like is what you just held up now like i said like i said before we started recording most people listen to the podcast so they like yeah, you, yeah. what you did was you showed the fly that you used yeah, for yeah. alligator gar and i think a lot of people maybe even myself included you know when i think if somebody if somebody tells me they're going to go fly fishing for alligator gar i'm automatically assuming they're throwing one of those big yeah musky flies and I, i'm just you know you 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 know you look at a fish like that that can get eight feet long and get these monster faces okay you know that's more what i would have anticipated they'll, they'll eat it but day in day out they're eating the shad yeah what make, makes makes more sense but um but so with a few different things, even doing little tube flies where you can build your own as big or small as you want and just always end up with a three inch, four inch fly. Yeah. Well, then, you know, the, the next thing you wonder is when you're talking about a fish that can be 10 pounds and on the next cast could be 200 pounds, you know, the, the variable in, in size is so crazy. Um, I don't know, man. Like, like I just tell me about the fly itself because, you know, I, I look at something like that and you know, I don't know any better, but I look at that and I become skeptical. Like, can that really handle a yeah. 200 uh, pound fish? Like, yeah, yeah. like, like, what are some of the benefits that I don't know that size yeah. hook provides? And one thing for like the alligator guard, we're using like SL12s, uh, this one or the short, uh, same stuff they're using for tarpon, GTs, yeah. and Christmas Island stuff like that. I mean, you can put a lot of pressure on that hook. I've hooked the bottom of a lake and was like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to break it. <laughs> but yeah, just stuff like that. Strong hooks. Uh like I said, the SC fifteens that I'll use. Same brand. Uh and it's not I'm not sponsored or anything by them. I just like these hooks. A little mm -hmm. thinner wire, but better for the for the long nose gar. Uh one knot size two, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but and then uh with that one, an alligator gar will snap that hook if he's big. S the SC fifteen. But those SL twelves okay. are, are stronger. Then from there, pick, picking the right leader and then tying good knots, you know. Uh, the 12 weight fly rod can handle a 100-pound fish. Right, After yeah. that, I'm not sure. <laughs> We're pushing yeah. our luck. We're gonna try. So There's only one way to good. find out. Yeah, exactly. I but, probably broke two, two 10 weights, so I know that was too light, you know. Yeah. Well, kind of what they're notorious about, maybe more so the long nose guard than the alligator gar, is like the difficulty in driving a hook through the bill. Yeah. It's just yeah, the, the hardware that they bring. They're going to throw hooks. And that's, you know, like with, with fly fishing, people will do like lift trout mm -hmm. sets. Absolutely zero trout setting unless he's right at the boat. And like, I mean, like no fly line out. And that's your only option. Yeah. Rod tip in the water, preferably. Strip, 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 strip until he's jumping in the air or pulling line out. And the long nose is going to jump more likely. Alligator gar, if he's big, is going to take line out. Like fucking take line out. <laughs> and, and, and with a fly rod, you'll they have backing. You got ninety feet of fly line, and then you got ever how many hundred yards of of backing. Uh, and usually we're into our backing pretty quick with the big ones. Yeah, and so, in the river they're going to aim for the current, so you're definitely going to see your backing if he's a big one. Yeah, so like basically, aside from 
a certain style of uh, a hook setting. It's just a game of odds. It's like you, you. I guess you just have to factor in. It's the same with bait fishing. You pretty much have to factor in a a, a, a percentage of failure that you're going to have because they're just they're going to throw hooks. But uh, yeah, it's going to happen. Uh, one of the nice things is we've only been skunked like a couple times. You know, there's just tons of them, tons of options of other fish and stuff too. Yeah, uh, and getting a big fish to throw a hook doesn't always suck you know <laughs> right but we, we can at least get something in uh, like the last day i went was a, one of the slower days and we still got a 47 inch long nose gar so mm. you know it depends on how you look at it we didn't get the alligator gar but still big long nose gar and several of them but yeah oh well, then i guess the other side of that and i i could see a little bit like I, I saw the loop knot of the older leader that was on there but like your leader material you know i i kind of remember when i first started chasing alligator gar it was like 2010 it was like the accepted norm was like you have to use steel leader like steel well, leader at all times and huge yeah. hooks and, and i, I have they, they get leader shy yeah well, I ended up moving more towards the Kevlar cable that they have now, like Kevlar yeah. string, which I think is just superior in, in a lot of in a lot of ways. Yeah, uh, yeah. I do not like steel leader, but I was curious, you know, at the end of the day, it's like it's a sharp fish. I don't know if their teeth are really for cutting, but you know, their 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 yeah, scales can be sharp, good. the side yeah. of their body can be sharp. So I don't know what you're throwing leader leader wise on the flies just to combat, I don't know, just to have some abrasion resistance yeah, yeah. what so are you like tying typical, to them like typical setup like i said for the big ones 12 weight fly rod intermediate line like you throw for a lot of your tarpon stuff and then my butt section of my leader which goes my floating line usually 40 pound or 30 pound probably 40 i think 40 or 50 and then uh 20 to 25 20 to 30 pound middle section unless someone's doing igfa records uh and then my bite i'm usually i'm doing fluoro uh 50 to 80 pound fluoro. Uh, I've had a few chew throughs now on 50 pound. So I've gone to 80. I haven't had one chew through 80 yet. Yeah. So we'll see what, I mean, it's obviously still possible. Uh, but I see these guys use 200 pound line and crazy cable and stuff. And <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah, but taking the challenge out of it a little bit, but. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. But I mean, still we're landing those fish, you know, pretty quickly. Uh, again, not 200 pounder, but. We land them in fifteen to thirty minutes. You know? Now landing them is always the interesting part. Like yeah. that was always the fun part for me. It's like you know, we getting your hands on them. There's like the hazards that are involved. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, you know, I seen your photos, and it's like you know, sometimes you seem like you're in. I don't want to say regular boat, but then other times you're in this like. You know, I don't know what is it a flycraft. It look, yeah. looks like one of those inflatable boats. Yeah, I have a little flycraft like a that's just. It's a little two man, but it's so versatile. I can put it into any water, just like a kayak. You can just throw it in anywhere. It weighs 100 pounds. Uh, and yeah, any situation I can or I need to, I can implement that. And if I'm doing river stuff, I have an anchor. If I'm doing the flat stuff on the lake or the swamps, I can put a platform back there and push pole and sight fish, call out shots, you know, 12 o'clock, throw, you know, on the right hand side of that log, see if it eats, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. I, uh, what what are you yeah. normally doing for like for yourself or even for clients? You know, I want to get into the guiding side of it because I find that side of it so fascinating. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, because dude, I never wanted anything to do with having them damn things in my boat. You know, especially the little one, like especially yeah. the smaller, like squirrely ones. But like, yeah. are, what are you doing when you're when you're hooking them? Are you bringing them into the boat with you? Are you shaking them off boat side, or are you like taking them into the shallows? Like, how are you? You know, because getting them unhooked can be yeah yeah there's some dangers involved it depends on the on the size of the gar what the person wants a photo with them or not uh but i have these big long like foot long pliers that have a little handle and a little thing that'll grab a hook and you can kind of bloop pop it off so we will sometimes if it's not what we want and we're still anchored up and not pulled off you know just bloop right next to the boat but for those bigger fish or, or whatever that we want a picture with uh, the only answer is a lasso. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you can do it next to the boat. A long nose guard is going to go crazy. Alligator guard may be likely, depending on the size, but usually we're trying to bank them. Just get back there, bank it, slowly get up, run the lasso over the rod, get, a, you know, past the pectoral fins underneath them, cinch it up. A couple failures happen. You know, it's probably the most likely spot to lose the fish after you've already done all that work. Yeah. <laughs> But it's part of it. You can't net them. Uh, I learned that years ago, fishing some parts of the Brazos where I'd sight fishing for my kayak. Uh, get one in, try to net like a little two foot, three footer, 
and he chomped right through my net. And then I'm hooked up through my net in a kayak, like, uh, just cut the line, you know. He wins. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I've you know, definitely had a few heartbreakers, money. like, at at the bank. So I know how yeah. that goes. But, yeah. but uh, you know, I was, I was curious about that, especially when I saw your photos. And then I know, like, lassoing was always tough. But I would think, like, the length yeah. of the fly rod. Yeah. You know, it's it like it makes it a little bit of a shit show, but yeah, with a friend, we can get it done. A good, the right rope, <laughs> like having a yeah. rope that won't pinch, uh, you'll find out real quickly is important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now, yeah, are, are you fun. are you running the lasso like down the length of the rod and yeah. down the line? Yeah. yeah. So usually, guys hooked up, I'll try to run it over down the line, over line to over the fish's head, and then get you know past the fly and everything and cinch mm-hmm. it. Going the other way, you know, probably not a good idea. Yeah. That tail will hit you. <laughs> God. Well, I know that, like, what is, uh, you know, I saw that you kind of bounced between Dallas and, and Houston. Yeah. That's yeah. not a small trek. Like, that is, no, no. A, it's like two different worlds almost. Like, and that's why that, I do it. Uh, that and, and I moved to Dallas, but originally I'm from Houston. Okay. Houston warmer, stays warmer longer. Uh, my season starts with the white bass. We're hammering on them in February, sometimes January if it's warm enough. Uh, usually January is cold, and I want that to happen at least. Yeah. Uh, but then we hammer on them uh, until March, April there, and then I do a bit of Lake Condor and stuff. It's still cold in Dallas till April. Then April, they start getting their white bass run, you know. Little waves, day before me, depending on how it is. Did you ever do but, any, like, the coastal or, like, tide-affected sections of river for the alligator gar? That always fascinated me, the guys that are catching them in marshes right alongside yeah. redfish and stuff. Yeah, one of the first ones I ever personally caught a fly rod, I caught it in the marsh. That's cool, uh, yeah. Just threw a redfish crack fly at it and boom, got one. But I had had clients catch them before me, like, and had, which was kind of funny to think about. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll play in like the mouth of the Brazos, the mouth of the Trinity. There's redfish flats there too. Sometimes there's sharks in the mix with the alligator gar and stuff. So it's a good place to dabble. Any oxbows, swamps nearby to get fish trapped in them from hurricanes and flooding and stuff. Uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely something to think about and wouldn't count it out. There's some big gar that goes somewhere. Yeah, I I didn't spend enough time around Corpus Christi. I always thought like the coastal fishing down there is so fascinating to me because I got to see that. I had a few bayous that like you know just a couple miles down went out into the beat, like went out into the bay, and uh, <clears throat> I saw a big alligator gar, and I just didn't catch them. But I always thought it was so interesting. You know, yeah, the alligator gar, you'd have mullet jumping by, the alligator on the bank, but then a few miles down river, you're in in the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's always cool. It's always cool where there's like shared territory with. We we have some uh, swamps that are like oxbows of the river uh, that just, you know, from hurricanes, or but there's gar in there, there's bass in there, warmouth, all these crazy carp, buffalo, there's needlefish, mullet, <laughs> all these other weird yeah. things. It's yeah, it's, it's weird when, uh, well, we get some of that in Florida, obviously. Um, we don't have alligator gar and yeah. where I'm at in Florida. There's a few obscure little rivers up in Yeah. Um, uh, but it is it always it's always fun when you can catch like a snook and a tarpon and then like a bowfin and a bass all in the same spot. Yeah, it's like that, this is me in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is getting weird. But um yeah, dude, that the alligator gar fly fishing stuff. It's um it's a, now when you're out there chasing them, like is the alligator gar and and long nose gar thing kind of hand in hand, or is that two different approaches? Is there really is there like some differences there? They're or... a little hand in hand, uh, really. Yeah, pretty much hand in hand. Uh, the difference is just the regions. There's certain parts of like way up the Trinity, uh, like Highway 30 around Dallas. You get past the alligator gar zone. There's more there's more long nose gar and stuff like that. Same thing on the Brazos. You get to about Waco, the alligator gar zone. After that, long nose gar. So every river kind of has that zone. Other than that, same tactics, same kind of stuff. Uh, I'll find them hunting in the shallows, sight fish them. I'll find them rolling and take a long, slow gulp in, you know, big areas of the river. And we can kind of wait up and sight fish them there. Uh, but pretty similar stuff. Uh, again, just the hooks, the types of hooks I want to throw more often are different. Uh, that's about it, yeah. Yeah. They might eat soft water sometimes a little bit more. <laughs> It's just because right. they float. You get more opportunities of them floating higher. I feel like just. Yeah, nice I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. They they definitely seem like they hang out higher in the water column. 
Yeah, um, they'll hunt bushes like in slow water. You'll see like thirty of them in a bush. Yeah, they, they were on the Brazos, and there's like a creek that dumps in. There were like twenty of them with their faces right where the drop off, where the creek meets. Just hunting that, just different things to look for like that. They're opportunistic, but they're bait fish eaters. Now, why do you favor like a hooked fly over like you know the the rope fly, which is interesting? It's like let's. I don't even know if I'd call that a a true fly. It's like a yeah. I would. I, I, I've been kind of weird about the pro fly. I dabbled in it. Uh, I didn't like the way you fish it. You like throw out, let the gar eat, and he'll eat it, of course. And he kind of mm-hmm. like dangles his teeth up, and then you slowly pull him in. I'm yeah. more throw out, get the hook set, fight the fish. And so I didn't like that. And then there's always these rumors of like uh, different materials that you use might rip off, tangle that gar's mouth shut. Yeah. And if he throws it, he's tangled up, he dies probably. Yeah. So. That's been the biggest deterrent for me was that I like the garland to live, even though, you know, you might eat one every now and again. They're, they're pretty good table fare. <laughs> yeah. Not that I want to promote too much of it, but they are. Yeah. Well, the the rope fly is like a, I don't know. I'd love to, like, m- maybe even bring somebody on here that talks specifically to it. I've done the rope lure fishing for them many times, but I stopped doing it a long time ago because, uh, I don't know, I kind of agree with you. Like, I, I prefer to, like, hook the fish. Yeah. It feels weird. It's and it's like the success. Like uh, if they bite it, like like if they bite it, at least for me, it was like you pretty much guaranteed yeah. catching the fish. But yeah. I also felt like, I, in my opinion, I felt like they didn't fight as hard. I don't. It, it was like an awkward fight too. It was like, like weird wiggle. Yeah, it was like they did. They were more confused than trying yeah. to get away. And then when you yeah. get them both side, it kind of changed a little bit. But uh. But it's also just the pain, uh, getting the rope out of their beak. Not worth all the hassle. It's such a pain in the ass. You know, I try to get people away from it for those reasons. Yeah. It's but, popular uh, in, in the Midwest and in the, on the East Coast stuff. And it's unique. It's I mean, it's, uh, it's cool in that it's, like, unique only to one type of fish. Yeah. It's just like a, I don't know. I think I it's... It's a fascinating way to catch a fish because there's no hooks, but uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah I think it's guaranteed. Uh, I've had some where I was like, man, if if this thing would have broke my line, it would have been toast. Like yeah, guaranteed, exactly. it's, it's a goner. And if someone does that, immediately ties on like a twelve pound to twelve pound leader, sixteen pound leader, they're gonna cut through that. Yeah, and I yeah. see a lot of people whose foot leaders go all the time, so I can only imagine it's happening. Now the long nose gar, it, it interests me because. You know, they live sort of in the shadow of the alligator guards, especially in Texas. Like here in Florida, they're they're awesome because they're like the big yeah. one. You know what I mean? And ironically and really frustrating to me, they everybody here in Florida, it makes me want to bang my head against the wall. They call all of them alligator gar. Yeah. Same, like that's, same around a lot of places here. <laughs> yeah, like that's not an alligator. I shouldn't care that much. It shouldn't yeah. matter. I was but... in the Buffalo River and an eight-year-old kid was saying it. And I was like, no, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I'll correct. Can I? I'll correct yeah. the kid. So what can I say? <laughs> I know. Oh, oh, I was the same way. I, do, I correct him at the aquarium. <laughs> I, like, I, I went to the aquarium. There was like I wanted to go see the gar, and there's a little boy there. He's like, "Look, Dad, swordfish." I'm like it ain't a swordfish. <laughs> yeah. like, right. Then I realized I'm arguing with an eight year old kid yelling at some guy's son. I was like, "I better cut it out." Like, yeah. <laughs> swordfish. <laughs> but uh, but but. Still, like in Texas, I feel like, you know, they live sort of in the shadow. Like people, like alligator gar having like a, there's like a renaissance of sorts going on with them. You know what I mean? Like they're yeah, there's definitely a good alligator. Yeah, they're like sure. yeah, man. But people are coming on to it. People are traveling from other countries. Yeah, you know, yeah. they're really sort of hitting it big. And I try to like let people know, I was like, man, yeah, you got to check out their smaller cousin because this is still a fish that can get. <laughs> 60 inches long like they yeah, still yeah. get our, our biggest is 55 inches i think the state record is a fly record at 60 inches yeah uh, and i've seen one on the brazos connected another river connects that i thought was a giant alligator gar and it was a long yeah. one for uh, whatever I, reason man them, them, i would like I, to kiss that one <laughs> yeah sure. i've but encountered I, I, like pushing 40 pounds 50 pounds yeah now i've Which, seen fish in the in the high 50s here in florida but they just don't have the mass yeah. of the ones in texas for whatever reason i can't i can't figure it seems like we have all the resources for food we got the longer year that's warm all year all year long they can be feeding all year long 
And so, like, we'll find these giant longnose gar here in Florida. They got great colors. That's about all they have. Like, you know, we'll find them in the springs here, like in the crystal yeah. clear springs, giant ones, but they cool just don't have the mass. Yeah. But, man, we caught a couple in the Red River, but, like, you know, between Oklahoma and Texas that were, yeah. that were like, you know, 60-inch class fish, but as big around as your thigh. Yeah. Just, yeah, and so that's an... Thick. It's crazy. Yeah. And these are predatory fish that will tail walk, that will eat lures, that are hard to hook up on, that you got to work to get. And I'm like, man, this is like such an appealing predator for people that yeah. want a challenging sport fish on fly gear, on lures. So like that one's interesting to me. And I, I you sort of answered it. I was like, curious, like what your top end fish were. But like what's considered like, I don't know, for people that are listening, you know, people I got people around here, they'll see a 40 inch and like, they're huge. I'm like, well, they get a lot bigger than that, buddy. Like, what what is considered like, you know. 40 inch is like, you'll find them in most places that they are here. Uh, yeah. We're going to know 50 plus. That's a that's a pretty damn big one. But, yeah, it's so like know, the 50 inch marks. In the hill country, there's some unicorns here and there. But yeah, over 50 is a pretty good one. Uh, you can get 40, a 45 inch or most time trying. Yeah. Pretty. Yeah. So yeah, that's, say, it seems like in like I don't know if you want to say gar community, but like the 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 small circle of people that run in the gar game, it seems like <laughs> fifty inches has always kind of been like that. That's a good that good. yeah, it's like the agreed upon measure of that's like your trophy class long nose gar. I don't know, man. Like I don't know if you agree. I feel like once they hit fifty inches and above, it's like it feels like a different fish. I like, think to me, so. like, they, they don't fight, fight like they jump like crazy. Yeah. I mean, if I could catch them 50 inches all day, every day, I would, I would definitely be good. Oh my gosh, man. Me too. I don't know, dude. It's like, I've caught they a few like, days when we're just like on a bunch of big ones, but usually it's, you know, kind of rare to get one over 50. <laughs> yeah. I've been surprised by how powerful they feel. Like, you know, you think of a long skinny fish, not using the power game. You think, okay, this thing's going to be thrashing and jumping and head shaking and, and you know, getting squirrely on me, but like I've been so su real surprised at how hard some of like the 50, 55 inch, like bigger class guard, like dig, like empower yeah. game you. They're still taking blood, they're still taking line out. We're sometimes confused if they don't jump, thinking they're alligator guard. Mm -hmm. I mean, they yep. fight that hard for sure. I've they're seen awesome. that too. So I don't know, I'm man. Not I... sure, I'm not sure. And then he finally jumps. It's like, ah, oh, tricky son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, dude. It's like you just, you really want to see more people, or maybe you don't want to see more people getting on it. So you have the resource all to yourself to a point. Yeah, but uh, they're, you know, they're you want you like to see less of uh, less poaching on, less killing on for no reason. Again, yeah. great table fare, but don't just throw it on the bank. Don't poach it right. illegally, which we see. If you go to Livingston Dam and you sit there long enough, you're going to see poaching happen. Yeah, and it, it's every, almost every day, if not at least once a week, which is insane to think about. Yeah. Well, I was there the most recent time I was there in that precise area it was like two years ago. I was there. And yeah, you, you find the dead ones on the bank. You're like, man, like, yeah. And it's crazy because there's guys there that are there to eat them. That's what they're yeah. There. Eat, so eat the damn things. 20% of people that just, yeah. Well, some of the carcasses that I saw, like it was clear that they had been cleaned out. I'm like, well, that's not really, you know, I, I don't care about that. Like, yeah. Eat, at least, eat fish, at least you know he I mean? did something with it. Yeah. <laughs> I've yeah, been so one of those that where they did that and he's got a big old head on it still. And they can yeah, I know. <laughs> not feel bad and put in the ant pile. <laughs> right. Well, looking through your stuff is awesome because like you're you're fly fishing for a lot of these meat eaters. You know what I mean? Like I love to put fish like alligator gar, long nose gar, and even bowfin, which is even like even in more recent times, starting to see you're starting to see them pop up every now and then. Like oh, like oh shit! Like there's somebody that's made an article in Field and Stream about Bowfin. Like, I never thought I'd see the day. But yeah, I feel like I got on Bowfin pretty early. And when I was doing it, uh, there was one guy fly fishing on Lake Champlain. And he had, like, a YouTube video. That was the only information. And then yeah. there was Dr. Solomon David. Yeah. And he had a scientific write-up on about their, like, spawning habitats, temperature range, bait fish break. And I put those two together in time on the water, and that's how I figured it out. There was no other videos, no, nothing. Yeah. Barely anyone catching one on a, on conventional that wasn't like, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> now, I have chased bowfin longer than any other fish I've ever chased, yeah, but I've awesome. always been the guy slinging meat at them. Uh, yeah. I've, I've 
you know, don't get me wrong. I fly fished for them as well. I caught them on bluegill as a kid. I mean, yeah. I lived, I lived where they're from. I caught them on crawfish a bunch. Yeah. I'm that's much more I'm interested in how you're doing. I, I've had a couple other guys on here. The guy you're talking about that's doing it on Champlain is Drew Price. Yeah, Drew, Drew. He, he's, he's been the on the podcast. Yeah. For him I'm aware of. Drew's awesome. He's He's been a big proponent for him. He's been on this podcast. There's a guy now in Michigan uh, named David Hurley. David Hurley, yeah. He's been on the podcast. There's a guy, a young kid in Georgia, uh, still newer on the scene, fly fishing for him in like the Okefenokee Swamp. That's He's awesome. been on the podcast. But what I like about it is like you got a guy in Michigan in the Great Lakes yeah. fishing for him in crystal clear water. You got a guy over in Vermont fishing for him on like, you know, uh, 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 you know, right there near Canada. You got yeah. a kid it's down here in the area. southeast fishing for him in Georgia. Now I got you over here in Texas. <laughs> so it's 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 clearly evident that it's a it's like a style of fishing that's budding up. But, you know, I love to see the contrast in people's styles. Um, you know, oh, and there's a guy, Grant Alvis. I, I feel like I'm shitting on the guy, but uh, he, he's he's real big on it. And uh, he's been on the podcast as well. I got all the bowfin guys. That's you know awesome, what I mean? Like, um, and, and he's doing it in Virginia, which is interesting because he catches them right alongside snakeheads. It's an interesting dynamic. Uh-huh. You know, That's what they, I'm going to do the snakehead thing still. I've done it, and I fished with Grant, and I fished with this guy, uh, Josh Dolan, and it's just like, well, that is a phenomenal style. For a fish that looks similar to bowfin, it's not Different the same. Player. Not yeah. the same. Not the same thing. It's, and it's and you'll catch them side by side, but yeah. but um, and it, we'll we'll get the same thing here in Florida. Uh, I got a couple of canals here in Florida where I'll see bowfin and bullseye snakeheads together. I yeah, said, man, it's the bullseyes, not the northerns. Yeah, I want to see them. Gotta catch the bullseye too. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll maybe this is a controversial take but i believe the bullseye actually fights harder than the northern okay. snakehead you wouldn't think it because they're like they're longer yeah, and snaky they're longer and more slender in the you know the the northern snakeheads that, that got that heavy body but dude i'm telling you the bullseyes they they throw down like that I mean, that is a, <laughs> man they're uh uh, they're a brawler. I put them up there in some of the hardest fighting freshwater fish of all of them, like pound for pound. But but my heart is with the bowfin, and I want to stick yeah. on that topic. Yeah, yeah. Because I think that might have been how I found your page. Like that was my entry point into finding your your Instagram page. Is uh, you know, I follow like hashtag bowfin. I follow like all yeah. the bow. I want to see some bowfin stuff. And there was this bowfin nuts follow that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was this video you had put up in some kind of swamp where it's like this laid up bowfin. You probably know yeah. the video I'm talking about. It's looking 100%. straight. I mean, this thing's looking straight at you. You can see it clear as day. And it's like, it looks like it's in like six inches of water. Yeah, way like, back in this swamp. It's almost the furthest back she could yeah, get. I mean, you're way in there. And then yeah. uh, you lay this fly down on it and just got this awesome video to eat. And I was like, that's badass. And so that, tell me that about it. It was so good. T- tell me about that because you know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I, like I said, I've had all these guys on here and I sort of ask them all the same questions. So maybe I'm being repetitive. I don't care. I like, I love this fish and I like to know how people, you know, because like it's one of those fish that uh, has a lot of detractors, has yeah. a lot of people saying they ain't worth the shit. Like, what, yeah. why, ch- like you shouldn't be chasing them. So, like, how did you, you know, have your reckoning with the fish? Did you just catch one before you heard the, the negativity or, like, how did no. you stumble across them as a species? Uh, so I grew up where they're big part of their region where I am. We're in the pine tree forest. Uh, Sam Houston's just above where I'm from. Uh, so we just, all the time as a kid, every little pond, nook, and cranny, you'll find them just about. Uh, especially bait fishing. Occasionally work in a lure, mostly like a worm or something. Occasionally you get a topwater frog eat or something, but... Well, that was my introduction. We'd catch them all the time around town and stuff, mostly like, oh, dang. Uh, but then later on in life, I started fly fishing. It was about 12 years ago or so. Uh, and uh, I'm out on Lake Conroe fly fishing for grass carp. And I think I hooked like five that day. They all broke me off. And I was like, you know, fuck these grass carp. I'd been seeing these both yeah. in and <laughs> contemplating it for six months for some. It took me this long until I contemplated it and decided to go do it. And, uh, Finally, I was just mad at them, tied on a little crawfish fly. I went to where I'd been seeing them rolling and caught four. I was like, well, shit, that was easy. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, I was like, oh, they fight. They're awesome. 
Uh, so from there, I started blind casting for them, reading up on them, uh, throwing the rollers, though. That's how I started. Uh, and slowly started putting together that I could sight push them on the flats out on Lake Connor. Uh, and there's just these awesome grass flats and little creek swamps and stuff where they come into, vegetation, log structure, things like that that I'm looking for. And just pulling around in the kayak and in my fly craft, uh, sight fishing them, like little crawfish flies, like bead chain, almost like a redfish style fly, bunny tail yeah. or crumper. Uh, just getting that weight uh, right because you're throwing in the grass. If you go too heavy, it's in the grass, it's gone, uh, and they'll lose it. But you really want to see it. But like, say, like that laid up open, she's staring at us. Uh, she sees us, she's fully aware that we're there. Mm-hmm. They're a predator, they're not scared of anything else. That's one of the nice things about them. We can pull in and, oh, she's staring at us 10 feet from us, and we'll still eat a crawfish fly. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that that fish, we threw to her a few times, and she I have a few different clips of it. And she really wasn't having it. But for whatever reason, when he threw over, like she's facing us, when he threw over her, bounced back, she was like aware of it, but it came up and it hit the top of the water and made ripples. Goes back down, that triggered her. Yeah. So there's something with this little nose mandible, lateral line sensory. Little things like that, especially going over and coming back, that will just trigger trigger them. And then you get that fin wiggle, and that's their personality, their thought process to me. Watch that fin. Uh, it'll it'll wiggle a certain way when they don't like what they see or when they're thinking. Like maybe they do like what they see or when they're really fucking happy and they're like smoking it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah. It. Like, yeah. You know, like you get to see all that. And it's in their person. So that that little fin wiggle thing is just been hard in my mind ever since and i'm chasing it you know bigger fin wiggles more more fish uh but yeah i've been doing that caught the state record on fly a few years ago with a client a guy has Ooh. since beaten lake fork so i gotta come back for vengeance and beat that guy <laughs> that's awesome how big was it you know i gotta ask now yeah the one that my client caught was like seven point something okay uh, the guy now on fork has an on fly because the conventional records with it uh, is like nine point something pounds mm-hmm. Pretty, pretty big bowfin. I've caught a lot of eights, a lot of maybe that yeah. were bigger if I weighed them, but not really too many over 10. I've seen one that I thought was a grass carp one time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know he was bigger. <laughs> yeah. But, I've been uh, fooled yeah. a few times the same way to thinking that they're a grass carp. It's funny. You know, their body shape is sort of similar. Too. Uh, yeah. Like, oh, no, oh, and he was going away. Uh, yeah. But yeah, through the years, I've been seeing them forever and read up on it. Put time on the water, pulled, I pulled, you know, all kinds of, I pulled all Lake Connor pretty much. But since then, I've learned them, uh, Lake Houston's a little too dirty, but that's like the next nearest lake. I've learned them on some of the swamps that are like Oxbows of the Trinity, the Brazos and stuff. Uh, and then I got them on Lake Fork, Tawakini, Hubbard, Caddo, all the stuff up here too. Been learned because, you know, yeah. it's the closer the better to me, I'd rather do. I'm right on Hubbard. I can drive 30 minutes and probably catch a boat in right now. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. yeah so I, been going both in nuts. <laughs> now, are you the same way? Like, uh, is it more of a, I mean, are you strictly sight fishing or like predominantly sight fishing with them? Yeah. Now that I've like, like, like early on, no, because I was learning it. But now that I've learned the sight fishing game, that's like what I want to do. I'm not trying to yeah. waste anyone's time. I just want to let's go find it, do the hunt. I'm big. That's like with the fly rod, I'm big into spot stocking uh, with, a, with a fly rod, basically. Same thing with the carp, all the other stuff. I just yeah. want to sneak up, make the shot, trick the fish, and do all the rest of it. Uh, and that's where I equate the fly fishing stuff to, like, if you're a hunter, the boat world. You know, yeah. it really does have some crossover. And yeah, I like that, how you relate it to hunting. That's I, I kind of get the same way. Like, when I get the itch to go chase bowfin, like, with lures, Yeah, I mean, for me, it's like sight fishing or I'm not doing it. Because, yeah. like, I mean, especially for me, like, if I get out slinging lures, I'm just going to be catching bass. Yeah. You know, it's like I, so it's like a lot of time but yeah it's um you know it's it's interesting too is uh like how close are you getting to, are you like uh like it's, are you seeing them from a good distance and launching it or are you kind of like just jigging it on front of their face or like definitely a, a mixture we've had 20 30 foot shots uh in the thick vegetation that can be hard though especially if you're not proficient with a fly rod mm-hmm. but like i said they're so in tune with their environment and not scared of anything uh, the only predator is me or, or a couple guys that are targeting them. That's their only predator ever. 
uh, they feel a boat and they will just come and check you out. Like, Hey, what's that? What are you doing? Yes. We've been having lunch in the boat and like all of a sudden there's a boat on the left and the right. Like, <laughs> it's, it's the, so it's playing off of that instinct too. It'll work out in your favor. Sometimes just it, taking that break in the thick of the shit where you know they should be. And they'll, yeah. Oh, there he is. It's so it's funny. Like, you're describing that because I've had the, <laughs> We're like, I've had the same story with all these guys I just mentioned earlier. I have brought up the same thing where there's like, there'll be times where it has happened to me because I do a lot of canoe fishing and a lot of times I'm bait fishing. So like I'm sitting there anyway, just like chilling, waiting on like, you know, one of the floats to go off. And all of a sudden I'm like, the hell is that? And I look down and you just see that fin go. I'm like, they'll come up and like put their nose on the canoe and be like looking around. Like they this thing is checking me out. Like yeah, just curious. Their little so. brain has something going on in there. Yeah. But and it's so funny. Eat, they only eat two feet from the boat. Yeah. Well, that's, it's funny you described that. So, but well, okay. So, and I know we talked a little bit about, I feel like you have the same issue with Bofin that you do almost with Gar and that they're sort of difficult to get a hook to like really stay, you know, so they got just a tough mouth and they yeah, like, they're, they're just, just to touch they're on, so good at getting off. Can I get two ahead? Uh, you were talking about Drew Price earlier. Yeah, His yeah. video 10 years ago uh, that I saw on YouTube or whatever, you, maybe you've seen it where he splashes the paddle to attract yeah. the boat. He calls it like a splash bang or something yeah. like that. I forgot what he called it. He, he described that tactic on the podcast. So I've had success doing it uh, with a guy at, during the spawn, high water scenario. Saw his video, always wanted to pull it off, you know. Yeah. This fish was four feet back in the bushes, colored up green male. And this guy I'm with is just hammering. He's caught big bass all day, big bowfin, just having an incredible day. Uh, we get up to this bowfin and I'm like, let's try the splash thing. Splash it, and the bowfin stops, turns, splash it again. He comes all the way to the tip of the bushes. Yeah. Drop the fly, and he drops the fly and smokes it. Boom. Fucking Drew got us one, you know. <laughs> yeah. So cool. But to build on that, we we let that fish go get our pictures, go catch a big female that's like six pounds, let her go, come back. That bowfin's in the same spot back in the bushes, and we're like, see if we'll do it again. Splash comes out, eats, sick. just crazy, <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Like both don't get it. They don't get it. I go know that. Way. They, you can. We had that one on the bayou. Eat, break us off. Go back to throwing in some carp. One slid up, slid back up. Could see the fly in his mouth. Put another fly back on him. Eats it, you know. But just I, now, I I have seen that happen as well. Well, I've never caught the same fish twice, but I've yeah. had like them all the way buttoned and hooked, and like fought all the way to the boat, and then get off yeah. and swim off. And I I <laughs> watch them retreat off to the bushes, go fish around a little while, let them calm down, come back like twenty minutes later, and they eat again. Yeah, like most fish won't do that, but it's like I don't know. They're like machines. I'll have to send this to Drew. He'll get a kick out of that. That his yeah. uh, that his method. Somebody yeah. watched it and found success with it. But, uh, I, I, uh, it's mostly in these high water situations because we're catching them in such shallow water all the time. Mm-hmm. But when we get spring floods, it works. Yeah. Well, for me, like in the a lot of the bait fishing I do is um I don't know, man. Like a lot of times when I go bow fishing now, like ninety percent of the time I'm like strictly looking for the giant ones. Like yeah. I've gotten to a point now where like I'll go both in fishing for an entire day just to catch it's one. Yeah. And but it'll be a giant one. But um I thought about like what Drew mentioned. Like they're just attraction to disturbances on top of the water. And I'm like, you know, I use a sliding float, like a balsa float that's just, you know, they just slide up and down the line. I'm like, I I want to try using a popping cork like I what we do. Perfect. Like yeah. You know, when my bait's sitting there and hadn't been touched in a while, I'm I'm just trying to draw them. You know, I, I stick my bait along the grass line. We have like high ascent mats that they get up underneath, mm-hmm. and I need to draw them out. I'm like, I, want, I bet if I throw like a popping court and just on the occasion just go, bop, bop, it'll at least I, I bet bring them out. I need to They're try like, it. It's a little weird about top water though. Like trying to sight fish them where the top water is, is damn near impossible. Yeah, We've tried it's funny. Yeah, don't fall all the way to the boat. But you like almost have to like not know they're there, come over, just ripping it and get a surprise. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen the same thing. Well, you really get the do you really get the stark contrast between them and the snakeheads because you were throwing frogs in like Virginia. Yeah, and they love it. Yeah. And um, you know, what I noticed is like uh 
in, in my experience anyway, I don't know, dude. Like it, Virginia was weird. It's the only place where I've seen Bofin like come from a long distance to come hit a topwater lure. Like for me, like uh, everywhere else I've ever fished, it had to be within. And I guess that's a good question for the fly fishing. Like their, their strike radius seems small. Like it has to come near them. I think you want uh, within six inches of their nose, really. Like, ideally. Yeah. We'll get some that maybe will move two feet, but not trying to lead them two feet most of the time. Yeah. So I always figured, like, uh, we throw the fly out, and when he sees it, from there we're reading his body language. What's he doing? If we twitch it one more time when we do something, you know, like things like that. We're going off of that fin wiggle and his personality. Yeah. The fin wiggle. I like that you mentioned that because why is there or not? Yeah. Where he wants it. It's funny you mention that because that that's a that is an observation that I've seen too, and all these other guys mentioned the same thing. It's like if you can just get that fin when they're laying there like totally still, yeah. Because I've had moments here in like the Everglades. There's, I mean, there's both in everywhere, uh, and there's all these canals all over the place. I can just walk the entire length of the canal, just pick which bow fin I want to catch. You know, sight oh, fishing for. Not a bad. <laughs> yeah, and uh, well, the problem is all these Florida gar. And I don't want to shit on Gar, but like, golly, yeah. it's hard to be. And there's so many of them. Like, yeah. talk about. So you'll have this blanket of, I'm talking thousands of them. I don't know how <laughs> anything else survives in these canals. Just getting the lure of the bait below them where the bowfin is at is like the hardest part of the whole thing. But anyway, I'll have these times where I'll see bowfin. I'm like, they must know I'm there. And I'll just like literally be jigging a crawfish off of their forehead smacking them in the head with it they yeah. just, and they're just that fin doesn't move but yeah it's like if you just, if that fin begins moving it's sort of it's, like that is the precursor to the bite and yeah. he's either angry and wants to leave or yeah. it's about to bite but yeah now we have uh, had fish that we have thrown to literally 50 plus times and got them to eat them <laughs> yeah just throwing here wouldn't throw in here wouldn't throw it like the guy just didn't turn Finally, over in surprise, ate it. But literally, like, 53, I was like, are you done throwing yet? We can keep pulling. And whenever you're ready, fucking eats like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like, definitely one of those fish that'll keep you guessing, because I've done the same yeah. thing at that same canal where I dropped a chunk of meat on their face. I'm like, there's no way they're going to turn that down. And they still don't. I'm like, what in the hell? Is it full? <laughs> like, is it, it like full? An, oh. an instinctual trigger, I feel like, still, that you can... Yeah. Sometimes get still. Well, I don't know, man. I think like the common theme with you is this pursuit of non-traditional species. And that's why I love your stuff. I'm, I speak my language. You know what I mean? And I um, <laughs> yeah. And you do you. So you do alligator gar, long nose gar, probably even the spotted gar and short nose gar. Yeah, both they spawn with, when the carp are spawning, we can go in there and catch them on the same flies. Yeah. Uh, up to 10 pounds sometimes when they're, when they're all the females show up. Well, I see the carp uh, woodwork in the background, that, that piece you have in the back. So I know you do a lot of carp fishing on the fly. And I've also seen your photos. I've seen your photos of the buffalo as well. Yeah, so I want to, like, you know, maybe we'll move through this one sort of quickly. I don't want to get yeah, lose no our worries. time here. But, um, <laughs> you know, that's one of those interesting ones because they look so similar. But it's two species yeah. of fish. I they don't know a lot of people that fly fish for buffalo. Yeah. What is the difference there, like? I was like, oh, that's cool. He's fly fishing for buffalo. Is this yeah. like, is that the same thing or is there like some big differences? There's some crossover, but a little different fish for sure. Like, obviously, one's native, one's not. Buffalo are native, commons are. Mm -hmm. Commons are way more aggressive in their feeding habits. Like, you put a fish in that six inch V in front of their nose and it hits the bot or a fly and it hits the bottom in front of their nose, they're going to eat it pretty much as, as long as they see it. Uh, bright orange is my go to because they'll eat it and I can see it. Uh, but the buffalo, on the other hand, are not quite so jumpy on the fly. Like, I always say they have, like, a feed zone, like, 50-inch piece right in front of their nose. Like, that's where you want it. And they're feeding on bugs and clams and stuff, mostly facing up river. Uh, and they really won't move. They, like, you can throw. They have little black beady eyes. Just, they're not really, like, sight-fishing predators, I feel like. Yeah. Uh, every now and again, you get one that will zoom over for a worm fly, like a red or a wine-colored worm fly. Every now and again, one will eat a damsel nymph for whatever. But I think if you go and pump their stomachs, they're eating a lot of like scuds and just little nymphs like trout do. 
Uh, and so yeah. it, it can be a little more difficult, but you go there, you downsize size 10, stuff like that, and can get to fly in front of them. They will eat it. A uh, little gray mop fly, all kinds of little size 10 stuff though. But yeah, more traditional style bugs for them. Uh, and except for the worm, because they'll take a red salmon worm or they call it a hybrid carp fly. It's into imitating worms or clams because they eat the, the bigger the buffalo get, the more clams they eat as well as the common carp. I think once they all kind of hit 10 or 15 pounds, they become real yeah. muscle uh, oh. But yeah, the, a little more difficult. They don't fight quite as hard as the common carp either. Yeah, they I agree with that. Yeah. Baggy, but they have their days. They're, they can be spunky. We get a couple different tree seed things that happen, like the elm tree seeds and the cottonwood seeds. The elm trees, you'll see them get on it a little bit. The commons love it. But the buffalo really like the cottonwood seeds. So if you can find a bunch of cottonwood seeds running into a log pile and current, you'll see little buffalo mouth seeding, and you can get yeah. them on drive by, which is pretty <laughs> cool. And yeah. they're, they're pretty surprised. You get a little tussle out of them for a little bit. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's kind of the general rundown. Uh, they're just a little different, but kind of similar in a way, too. You could probably take the, the what the trout guys do with an indicator and have a lot more success than just sight fishing them with a single fly. Yeah. I, I don't do it as much. I look for, like, big singles doing the right thing, and then I'll throw to them. Uh, but they're all catchable. Uh, the bigger, the better. The bigger his mouth is, the more he's probably eating bigger meals. Right. But yeah, that's kind of the buffalo rundown. Uh, expect frustration. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's yeah. the thing. Like the carp has become this massive target for the fly fishermen. Yeah. Like across yeah. the country, they've really yeah, like exploded. Yeah. Um, but the buffalo is like one of those ones where it's like, man, you talk about a fish that can get. 70 pounds like yeah, I've yeah. Pounds on, uh, doing euro carp and stuff in austin yeah before. yeah i've done yeah, the same <laughs> um i've done the i've done the same uh on lake fork and and some of that with with the with fork the bait and it's uh but from as from a fly standpoint gosh i just when you think about if there's an opportunity to catch a 60 pound buffalo because you think yeah. of all the challenges they present obviously just in sheer size the timid behavior the small strike radius, the fact you have a 60 pound fish with a mouth that's as big as like a nickel and you got to like, you know, and and they're sensitive too. like even bait fishing. I remember, you know, I fished like shout out to my buddy Austin Anderson is like, he's like the Buffalo King out there as far as like Euro (laughs) style. And, uh, I mean, this kid's caught so many giant ones, but, uh, we, we, we fished with him two years ago and, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like the difference and, you know, you have these two fish that live side by side. There's a lot of crossover and like where they hang out and some behaviors, but a lot of differences. Like the common carp will just grab the bait and go. Yeah. The so buffalo, yeah, yeah. But the buffalo was like, dude, we caught. He caught one that was sixty-one pounds when we were out there with him. I caught one that was fifty pounds. <laughs> these damn fish. Like I'm talking about, the rod would be like, like barely moving. Yeah. Yeah. Like you got this eight, like sixty pound fish just nibbling like a bluegill. Yeah, <laughs> such a challenging fish, but I think on fly, man, th- that is a species I would love to see like some more attention around. I just, I don't yeah. know, these big fat lumbering fish that don't typically take lures. Yeah, you know, yeah, there are challenges. Uh, people just gotta understand what they're getting their, themselves into when they target them. You know. Yeah. And for a lot of clients, they want something a little faster, a little more agreeable. Uh, if we yeah. were to just target buffalo all day, like we might catch five, you know, like our best day without, you know, not counting snag fish because you're going to yeah. snag. If, you, if you're being honest, it's happening, you know. Uh, but yeah. yeah but common carp, I've had days where I've caught 24, you know, like sight fishing them with a fly. Just way more agreeable, way more of them willing to bite fight harder so it's hard to push the buffs unless it's the right person uh, right that's been yeah one reluctance there yeah other than that uh we don't really see those big 50 60 pounders get up shallow yeah that's so, what i'm thinking i, I would have i would figure 15, they're probably 20 pounders is at the biggest yeah. that's probably my biggest on flies about 15 now yeah. on the volume in houston uh, about as big as they get they they can't eventually can't fill in the flat some of them are so big. So usually it's like 10 pounds can fit, can fit. Smaller ones can't. And the concrete bayou has like flats, angles, deep channel. Uh, and you can't really see in the middle. You have to wait for the fish to come on the flat or feed on the edge. 
That's definitely one of those species that's like, man, I, I would love the opportunity to spend some time trying to crack that code. You know, you see the bow guys, like the bow fishermen, like get the gigantic big mouth buffalo and some of the black buffalo so they, they, big. They come in at night, though, you know. Uh, if you it go out at night it, on yeah. rivers and you shine a light out at night when you're paddling, buffalo everywhere. Yeah. Do that same run uh, an hour after daylight, they've all moved where they are. Just, it's just a safety thing for them. They want yeah. to feed them. There's a lot of bugs and, and other stuff for them to eat. But once that sun comes up, you know, there's birds and other things for them to worry about. Of course, you think they'd adapt to the both both thing, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you mentioned the word client, and I want to go down that road because that is... Um, I think it's awesome that you're um, able to have a business for yourself doing what you love. But also, it's like, you know, you're, you're a steward for these lesser... I don't even say lesser desired fish, but you know, species that need to be championed a little bit more. So I'm interested just, you know, I don't know anything about the guide world. I've had, I have had inquiries from people overseas asking if I would take them fishing for these stuff. So yeah. I know the interest is there, Definitely there, yeah. but like the people that are reaching out to you, what are most of them wanting to target? Like is the alligator gar, the big cell or like, uh, you know, I don't know, man, tell me a little bit about the experience, you know, so the interest that, a little newer for me, but largemouth bass sell the most. Uh, okay, out of okay. I do for sure. Largemouth. We're in Texas, uh, and we get a lot of them. Great river fishing on the Brazos for largemouth. It's been stellar the last few days, like stupid, mm -hmm. stupid good. And then Lake Conroe stuff. Uh, I had a guy catch a ten point seven pound largemouth on fly last year. Jeez. <laughs> so it's been like my go to, and then getting that big fish has been really helpful. Uh, white bass do really well for me early mm -hmm. in the run. Great for beginners and kids. And so, like fly fishing, you know, has a bit of a learning curve, and it's a great one to learn to cast and everything, and catch fish at the same time because you can just throw the fly in there and catch a white bass. So we get to like put everything else together, uh, and then uh, from there I start doing all the other weird stuff like carp, uh, both and gar. The gar again, uh, I've always kind of had it as my my, my my repertoire. If I could talk. Uh, but no one's ever really, I didn't realize like the interest, I guess, at first. And no one ever really pushed me enough to like really dabble in it until the last two years. Me and my buddy started kind of nerding out on it. Uh, my other buddy from Canada was in town and had gotten some big ones on fly. Uh, but yeah, who was a, I think I lost where I was going. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, you're going the right way. Cause I, I'm yeah. thinking like, I would think, especially people who come from, I don't know, out of town or out of, even out of state, you know, if, if they're going to leave with a, fish also, story so i expect uh, my summers are a little slower and i expect the, the alligator guard to hopefully fill that for me at least a little bit yeah and, i think that one is all right for me carp do okay for me not everyone likes carp fishing as much as you maybe think it's not like mm. the, the third best selling thing i do it's like maybe the third yeah um, well i yeah, think the, the, i think the alligator guard thing is it seems like in the last few years, like chasing them with artificials or chasing with flies yeah. really started to take hold an interest. But, uh, you know, you think about guys that travel, though, and then let's say they didn't even have any intentions of catching an alligator gar. You just happen to put them on one. Like they come op with an open mind. And they're going to catch some bass and some white bass. And then, you know, if they go home and they're going to like recap the experience that they had with you. And part of that experience was was, was catching up. Even a four foot long alligator gar, which by most standards is a small alligator gar, at that is a big fish. And yeah. they're gonna look at you know, it's one of those fish that the photos stops yeah. people like they're like, What the hell is that? Yeah, if, if you want some so, likes on Instagram, post an alligator gar. <laughs> well, I would even think inquiries as a guide, it's like, hey man, I heard about these alligator gar, but like I want to throw flies at them. I know people like that. They're like, I want to catch these these alligator gar, but I don't want to go throw. I don't want to go sit on a chunk. I don't want to go sit on the bank and waiting with meat. Like, no, I want to catch these the tarpon musky style. That's the way I want to go at it, with flies. Yeah, you will be grindy. Go musky style, sight fish, throw to rollers. Like that's I'm your guy. Uh, but yeah, just to add to how committed I am to that. I bought a, I bought a 17 foot bass tracker. I'm decking it out to to run the Trinity and the lower parts of the Brazos and stuff, and obviously do the lake bass fishing. Uh, but I expect that to to be a bigger deal and be able to do pretty good. I'm hoping at least, you know. Yeah, we'll stay ahead of the game. I I don't know. It's like, there's certain there's certain booms in like fishing genres that like you they're predictable. 
They're like yeah. inevitable. Like you look at a fish like an alligator gar, and it's like, man, their popularity is like, it's inevitable. It's like they're I think we're just they're, now building like how there's musky nuts. We're just now building the alligator gar nuts, and as people realize yeah. what all they can do, the whole range: bait fish, lure fish, small rattle traps, big musky lures. Because I've seen some guys doing that too. Flies, yeah. different ways to fly fish, full sink, intermediate, sight fish. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's the, just another perfect predator that's been underrated for too long. Yeah, well, if you're just uh, if you're just casually sharpening your sword and learning your fishery even more, especially now that you've moved, you know, and and you've kind of got that in your back pocket. When inevitably well, my, people my say, "Hey," for me was just open up the whole state to me. You know, whereas yeah. I was kind of locked in my. At two hour drives around Houston at the most. Now I fish from Houston to North Texas and a little in between. Uh, and yeah. you know, I'm willing to drive three hours for good fishing and taking people fishing. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's, what, that's always Unless interesting to me. Doubles. Is uh, <laughs> what's that? Unless gas doubles and then it might change to a couple lakes. Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome, dude. Well, I know we're getting a little short on time. I got a kid. A, I got to pick up from gymnastics here in a minute. But the people <laughs> that, um, you know, the people that want to see your stuff, let's say, because it's a, you got some awesome photos and even videos of the bowfin, the alligator guard, the long nose guard, the bass. I think I when I was looking through your stuff, I think I saw the big bass. Wasn't it? Was it an older yeah. gentleman that yeah. caught it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom, yeah, Tom. Ah. Was pretty good. <laughs> monster fish you got an awesome fishery so i would yeah, urge anybody to fish for those bass in a, an unconventional way too which is just kind of my style yeah fishing heavy scum with a fly rod like throwing i have this weedless fly i don't have it with me that i've kind of come up with and he's kind of we just had this epic top water day uh he's kind of dissing my weedless fly i'm like they're in here sometimes you know whatever <laughs> and my fish fucking eats and he's like this fly is awesome yeah. <laughs> it was so cool and he just went to mexico and fish came back and we caught a bigger bass than he caught in mexico so i was like yeah. oh you gotta love that yeah <laughs> yeah felt pretty good and then i still haven't caught a 10 pounder myself so to see that be a part of it net that fish it was fucking crazy <laughs> yeah that's crazy i well, I've, i haven't joined the double digit bass club yet i need to Me start either. trying more <laughs> Like, I, I really I want, I like a lot of, dude, I have been like pegged as like the trash fish guy. I'm like t- trying to tell people like, no, I love bass fishing. Yeah. I do a lot of my bass fishing in Florida in the winter time. We have phenomenal winter bass fishing. Yeah. So like rest assured in January, I'm going to be out there bass fishing like crazy. But, uh, but dude, I want a 10 pound bass so bad. <laughs> I'll be out of Lake Conroe. I'm there for bass 90% of the time, but everyone's yeah. still calling me the boat guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well I, yeah. <laughs> That's why where I am too. Is like I'm, I don't. I embrace it at this point. I'm like the bowfin guy. Actually, just got invited on to a podcast next week to talk about bowfin. I'm like, I just came back from the Amazon. Yeah. Like, I'll be the bowfin <laughs> guy. That's all good. I'll. Yeah. I'll be your. I'll be your bowfin guy. I'm cool with that. I. You know what? Whatever. But um. But hey, man, Danny, where can people find your stuff? Like your website for your guide service. Instagram, yeah, yeah. anything where people might be able to see some of your stuff. A YouTube channel, if you have that yeah, going so, on. So still still HoustonFlyVision.com uh, is my website. Obviously, I'm not just doing Houston stuff, but that's where I started. It's been published in books and whatever, so I'm kind of stuck with it for now. Hmm. Uh, and then uh, Instagram, Houston Fly Fishing. Uh, YouTube, Fly Fishing with Danny. Uh, and then, yeah, Facebook, Danny Scarborough. Right? That, whatever you want to look at. <laughs> that's awesome man well i'll put all that stuff up on the screen i'll put it in the descriptions i'll try to throw it out there who knows maybe <laughs> it, man. maybe you'll get some business out of it or maybe i don't know yeah. you'll get a couple of likes and subscribes but <laughs> yeah well, we're going into winter so we're going into our winter stuff but hey next year come alligator guard fishing come open fishing come bass whatever i do it all i uh, kind of go with the hot bite throughout the year uh and that's just the way my head yeah. works well dude not, i i'm like I'm chomping at the bit to get back out to Texas for alligator gar, but I'm like determined. Like, I've done the meat thing. I've done the yeah. carp chunks. I really want. And I'm not even a great fly fisherman, but I really want to. I really want that experience in yeah, like fucking... in the memory bank. You know what I mean? So the next time yeah. I come out there, I may have to give you a holler because yeah, I want to catch an out. alligator gar on a fly. But yeah. uh, but Danny, <laughs> I appreciate your time, man, and uh, we'll be in touch. And thank you for your time, dude. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you for listening to Boundless Pursuit. 
Tune in each week as we bring stories and insight from uniquely talented anglers and outdoorsmen. And if you enjoyed this show, I want to hear from you. Be sure to leave a five-star review as this is going to drive the growth and exposure of this show. And if you have feedback or guest suggestions, I would love to hear from you. And you can reach me at boundlesspursuitfishing at gmail.com. For all other collections of media and contact information, please visit www.boundless-pursuit.com.